Bonjour à tous. Et juste deux, trois petites minutes, on essaie de régler les derniers détails des, du lien YouTube et on va commencer la conférence. Tac. Bien. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. On va démarrer donc avec un petit peu de, de retard. Je ne vais, je vais pas être très très long. Déjà, bonjour à tous. Je suis ravi de vous accueillir, des collègues étudiants, des collègues des équipes de recherche, et puis euh, presque l'intégralité euh, de notre équipe kiné. On est ravi de vous accueillir. Euh, également euh, également des, des fédérations. Bonjour à la Fédération française de rugby qui est dans nos murs. C'est ces quelques jours. Euh, donc quelques mots d'abord pour vous accueillir pour cette première conférence organisée par le laboratoire en cette année olympique et paralympique. Euh, donc tout le, le mérite revient à Antonio Morales qui dira un petit mot juste après. Simplement vous dire que cette année on a changé un petit peu de, de format. On est plus passé sur un modèle à l'opportunité, c'est-à-dire que là on avait la possibilité de faire venir un expert dans un champ particulier. Et donc on a organisé ce temps-là, il y en aura euh, un autre à la fin du mois de février sur la partie psycho, toujours sur euh, la partie prévention. Et donc on est moins euh, sur des événements un peu plus conséquent comme vous avez peut-être pu voir l'année passée. D'abord parce qu'on est tous un peu focalisés, occupés par les événements de cette année, notamment la préparation des Jeux Olympiques et Paralympiques dans quelques mois. Donc bienvenue à tous. Euh, Aujourd'hui, c'est une vraie chance et un privilège euh, d'accueillir Jonathan Folland. Donc pour celles et ceux qui ne le connaîtraient pas, euh, le professeur Folland, il est professeur à l'université de Loughborough. Welcome, Jonathan. It's a great pleasure to have you on board today. Uh, and uh, I'm really keen and uh, I'm looking forward to, to listening to, to your talk. Um, donc uh, Jonathan développe une, uh, évidemment des travaux dans, dans le domaine de la biomécanique et de la physiologie, j'en dirai quelques mots. Il est membre de l'American College of Sports Medicine et de la Royal Society of Biology. Et il est également directeur adjoint d'un centre de recherche contre l'arthrose uh, et probablement qui présentera certains travaux. Donc il a... Uh, cette double balance entre des recherches cliniques et plus appliquées dans le domaine de la performance. Donc je pense que ce sera très intéressant de l'écouter. Il développe en parallèle une activité d'expertise et de conseil en matière d'entraînement physique et de performance pour plusieurs, plusieurs entités, notamment des entreprises comme Technogym ou des organismes sportifs, des organismes sportifs comme British Athletics. On en a parlé ce midi. 
euh, ou des clubs professionnels également. Alors, on le sait un petit peu moins, Jonathan, c'est également un passionné de sport, notamment d'athlés, euh, en particulier à course à pied. Il va nous en parler, il va nous parler de sprint. Euh, il y a plusieurs collègues qui vont être intéressés, je pense, cet après-midi. Et euh, il s'intéresse également au kayak qu'il a pratiqué en compétition, mais également comme entraîneur. Donc, il a vraiment plusieurs casquettes. Et de ce point de vue, je pense que ce qu'il va nous partager cet après-midi sera très intéressant. Euh, plus concrètement, et il l'expliquera le, mieux que moi, donc ses recherches s'intéressent principalement à la performance physique, à la condition physique, à l'entraînement, et en particulier à la fonction neuromusculaire, euh, force et puissance. Et ceci à différentes échelles du mouvement, depuis l'analyse de la performance en sport collectif, euh, il y a eu un papier qu'il a sorti au mois de janvier là, récemment, euh, et jusqu'à des échelles plus locales, et je pense qu'il nous en parlera en détail, euh, relatives aux muscles et aux tendons. Euh, les résultats de ces travaux trouvent évidemment des applications variées dans le domaine de la performance, de la prévention des blessures et de la santé en général, ce que je vous expliquais tout à l'heure. Donc, vous l'avez compris, on accueille aujourd'hui une référence internationale dans le domaine. Euh, donc, c'est un, un, un vrai honneur de, de l'accueillir. Encore une fois, hâte de l'entendre. Et avant de lui laisser la parole, je vais laisser la main à Antonio, qui va nous donner un petit mot d'intro à la fois pour contextualiser l'intervention et puis vous préparer aux différentes méthodes, approches que, que Jonathan va, va développer par la suite. Again, thank you for being here, Jonathan and uh, Antonio. The floor is yours. Thank you, Gael. Thank you, everyone, for, for being here. Thanks, uh, Jonathan, for, for coming and for proposing you also to share with us uh, some, some uh, of uh, your, your work. I'm just going to, sorry, open the, my presentation. Um, Uh, there we go. So yes, yeah, Gael said the idea. Um, I, I just started speaking English. Uh, je suis désolé, mais je l'ai pas, j'ai pas prévenu avant. Donc là, pour uh, pour uh, respect à Jonathan et qu'il puisse aussi uh, suivre, on va les faire en, en anglais. Donc et après, n'hésitez pas. Il y aura aussi un moment d'échange. On peut poser les questions si vous voulez en français ou en anglais. Uh, so I, I was just saying I will, I will continue in English. Uh, the idea here was just to do a little. Uh, contextualization of the presentation and also uh, take the opportunity uh, to show some of the wide variety of uh, work that uh, is being done in our laboratory. So again, the, I won't go uh, too deep into details. It's just uh, uh, giving very quick uh, some of the questions that are, are being targeted and uh, uh, related to, to the uh, career of Jonathan and also your topic. It's uh, um, Talking about muscle th strength is uh, not only important uh, from a mechanistic point, point of view in different areas of uh, research, uh, such as biomechanics or physiology, uh, but also it remains at the heart of uh, what many of us think when we try to optimize uh, performance. Uh, so ba very basic questions, uh, such as how force is produced, how uh, the active tissues and passive tissues can interact each other, uh, those remain uh, at different levels of our way to think about how we can translate uh, research into, into applied research. And uh, in this context, uh, that's where we thought it, it was maybe a good opportunity to show you some of the work. Uh, obviously, it's not uh, exhaustive, but some of the work that is, is being done here Uh, just some details about uh, a training intervention that uh, it took place uh, a few years ago now, and uh, it was eight weeks of uh, training, Nordic hamstring or isokinetic training, and some of the main variables that uh, we get to measure here uh, were like the, the, the behavior of the muscle fascicle, along with, as you can see here, a video, I don't know if uh, it reproduced, but you can see here that we are using, making use of uh, Elastograph, uh, ultra, ultrasonography, sorry, and, and more specifically putting together two probes, we can overcome some of the challenges, methodological challenges that uh, we, we face when we try to track fascicles uh, in low muscles, uh, uh, notably. And you can see some uh, previous results that were presented in the American College uh, um, Congress. And, uh, Uh, in which we can see the uh, wide var uh, variability, but as I said, I won't go uh, too much into detail into the results. Another uh, interesting technique that may allow us to go a bit deeper into the mechanical properties of the different issues is elastography. Here in the same project, we used it to track 
uh, during passive cycles. At the same time, the passive torque and also the, the elastic properties of the three main muscles of the hamstring, so semitendinous, uh, semitendinosus, uh, um, semimembranosus, and bicep femoris. And uh, it, could, uh, it allows us to go a bit more deep into the uh, passive uh, mechanical properties uh, and other interesting variables such as uh, joint modulus or hysteresis or at a local level, at a muscle level. Um, a bit more on the same technique, uh, uh, to give you another example of a work that, we, that it took place in the lab uh, in which we explored the effects of a warming up using either foam roll or cycling active, and uh, we observed some changes in the elastic properties of uh, the hamstrings as well. And uh, also a bit uh, like, a, as you can see, a wide variety of, uh, of topics and, and research questions. Here, a work from our colleague, uh, uh, ex colleague uh, Enzo Ville, uh, who uh, got to see during his PhD the effects of uh, different types of uh, surface and uh, how muscle and tendon was, were interac interacting with each other and responding when, uh, when working in different uh, surfaces. And uh, little by little, uh, we try also to, to put together other integrative uh, approaches uh, in which, uh, for example, you have this work of uh, Adele Mornas uh, uh, during her PhD, uh, who got to see some of the effects of uh, heat exposure and how uh, the, the active and passive uh, elements of the muscle tendon units may respond during uh, some analytic tasks, tasks or running, as you can see here, uh, some of the recent uh, uh, results uh, published in, 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 in the Medicine and, and Science uh, Journal. And uh, to wrap up, like in general, uh, as you can see, we, we can, like uh, from this central topic of uh, muscle tendon unit mechanical properties, we, we can have many questions, many problems, scientific problems that uh, we, we, we try to, to tackle from different uh, perspectives. Uh, but I, I would say like in parallel, Technology, it's always at the heart of, uh, uh, on one hand, the, the limitations and also the, uh, the difficulties that we have to measure in vivo these uh, properties, uh, but at the same time, the advances that uh, little by little we try to, uh, to, to keep up with them and uh, that allow, allows us to go a bit uh, deeper uh, into the, these characteristics. As you can see, for example, in the pictures, we can take the example of elastography, that it's uh, making progress not only to uh, overcome one of the main limitations, which is the 2D dimension, the two-dimension approach that we use, to go a bit further in the three-dimension approach and try to better understand how muscle behaves. Uh, also to be able with some uh, uh, analysis techniques to be able to better target different issues, tendons, aponeurosis, muscles, and trying to better understand uh, how they, they behave and how they respond to, to different uh, situations. The same happens with uh, MRI uh, in which uh, uh, up to date, it, it's really time consuming the fact that we have to segmentate everything and we have to manually do stuff. Uh, AI and uh, uh, a lot of uh, engineering work is going on to make this step uh, quicker and, uh, and valid. And uh, on the part of muscle architecture, uh, the same uh, things uh, applied uh, in which we are trying to work uh, to develop new algorithms that uh, help to uh, automatize some of the tasks when it comes to analyzing the muscle architecture. So I talked uh, mainly about uh, experimental research and uh, this main topic that concerns uh, today Jonathan, but uh, we are at INSEP, so we are, uh, we usually often we have a bigger sc scope. We try to take in into account obviously many other uh, particularities that we can find in, el in, in elite sport. And uh, I found this picture pretty uh, representative of what I try to say here is that uh, we try to make X not this way and try to align everything uh, to make sure that the transfer and also the good use of technology is being made. Thank you. So Jonathan, it's, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you to the Institute 
uh, especially Gail and Antonio, for the invitation to come and visit. Um, and thank you for the introduction and a little bit of good context, Antonio. That's really helpful for my talk. Um, I first heard about INSEP uh, nearly 35 years ago as a teenager. Uh, I have a personal interest in canoe and kayak racing, which I think was mentioned in the introduction. And uh, I read about some top athletes coming here to study and to train. Uh, so uh, it sounded like a really cool place. So I'm, I'm delighted to finally be able to visit and come and, uh, and learn a little bit more about what's going on here at the Institute. Um, I should just uh, first briefly introduce my home institution, which is Loughborough University. Uh, Loughborough is a town here uh, placed pretty centrally in the UK. Um, the university is a middle-sized uh, UK university, uh, but we generally rank pretty highly, one of the top 10 universities in the UK. Um, we have around 20,000 students on our campus, uh, which stretches from here back for about three kilometers. It's a very green campus with lots of uh, sports pitches and sports facilities, many indoor facilities, which you can't really see on this picture. Uh, and the university has a very strong reputation in actual performance, practical doing of sport, um, but also in the study, the teaching and research of sport. And we've been very fortunate uh, to win this accolade uh, in recent years, number one in the world for the study of sport-related subjects from the QS World University Rankings. Um, so that was my corporate advert done. I'm now going to concentrate on uh, science. So my, my topic today is muscle and tendon anatomy in relation to performance, injury risk, and training. I uh, have three main themes. First, the importance of mus muscle anatomy, particularly muscle size for athletic performance. Second, hamstrings anatomy and implications for sports injury. And then finally, resistance training effects on muscle and tendinous structures. So to get us thinking about the importance of muscle anatomy and size for the function and performance of muscles, I'm just going to start off with this not very serious question. This is, in English, we would say tongue-in-cheek uh, question. Who's got the strongest, most powerful muscles in this picture? Well, it's clearly not me at 75 kilos. It's not even this guy, Rob Miller, who's a former PhD student in the lab uh, at a little over 100 kilos but it's obviously this guy. His name is, is Eddie Hall, and I'll talk a little bit more about him later in the presentation. But of course, everybody picks the guy with the big muscles. Even if you put this picture or this question in front of anybody on the street, they will pick the guy with the big muscles because we have this intuitive idea that larger muscles are stronger and more powerful. And interestingly, there's a very solid physiological foundation to that idea, um, which is captured in this graph here which is the first careful scientific study that I'm aware of, which was from Japan in 1968, where they did careful measurements of muscle size, cross-sectional area of the elbow flexors, actually, and looked at its relationship with strength. So this is elbow flexor or arm strength, and each of these markers is one individual, quite a large population in this study. And you can see that there's a broad re relationship between muscle size and muscle strength, where individuals who are stronger tend to, sorry, who have larger muscles tend to be stronger. And there's a very clear physiological explanation for that relationship, which is captured in this uh, simplified cartoon here, but comes down to the number of cross bridges or sarcomeres arranged in parallel across the muscle. So we have a simplified uh, muscle here, just reduced down to a single sarcomere, the myosin, uh, and act in here in the cross bridges, uh, pulling the ends of the muscle, the tendon in white together, and it produces a certain amount of force. And if we have twice as much or four times as much contractile material, sarcomeres or cross bridges aligned in parallel across the muscle, essentially larger muscles, then we see greater force production. So these, these ideas have been well understood for decades. It's kind of interesting and surprising, therefore, that we don't really know much about the anatomy or the size of the muscles of athletes, particularly high-performing athletes, or how important these kind of factors to do with muscle size are, in fact, for athletic performance. So we've been doing a series of studies in that space, and I'm going to talk a little bit about them now. 
starting with this study, which is to do with muscle anatomy and sprint cycling power, which was done in collaboration with the English Institute of Sport. The aim here was to, to determine the relationship between muscle volume and cycling peak power output in elite cyclists. So we, we recruited 35 elite male cyclists competing in different disciplines from track sprinters through BMX, track pursuit, road and mountain biking. So a range from sprint to endurance disciplines. And just as evidence for their performance standard, collectively they had eight Olympic Games appearances, two medals, 37 senior world championships appearances and 10 medals. And we had each athlete attend the lab on two occasions to perform a series of ISO velocity sprints at a range of velocities from 60 up to 180 RPM on this type of ISO velocity ergometer. And this allowed us to draw the power cadence relationship for each athlete and actually our criterion measure of peak power output was the apex or the maxima of this power cadence relationship drawn from these two test sessions. The other main measurement in this study was muscle volume with an MRI scan. And we had a scan of each thigh in order to determine quadriceps and hamstrings muscle volume. And here's an example MRI image slice through the mid thigh here, an axial image through the mid thigh. And in the center of the image, you can see the bone, the femur. Around the outside, we can see the adipose tissue, actually a very thin layer in this athletic thigh. Uh, so towards the front, the anterior, you can see the four quadriceps to the posterior, the four parts of the hamstrings group. And for each muscle you can see here, we've very carefully segmented or drawn around each muscle in order to measure the anatomical cross-sectional area of that muscle. And if we collect images or slices all the way down the thigh or the limb segment, and we do this segmentation, we can accurately measure the volume of each of these muscles. And here's what we found. These are the, this is the relationship between peak power output during cycling and quadriceps muscle volume in cubic centimeters. And you can see each of these marks is a different individual, and we can see there's a pretty good strong relationship here, the correlation coefficient is 0.81. And if we, if I show the same data here for the hamstrings, it's peak power output again, now plotted against hamstrings muscle volume, we see a similar relationship, not quite as strong, not quite so tight this time, and a slightly weaker, but still fairly strong correlation coefficient of 0.72. So the conclusion from this study was that the volume of the thigh muscles and especially the quadriceps was the primary determinant of cycling peak power output and likely a critical factor for sprint cycling performance. But there's a couple of queries to do with this study. First of all, I'm very conscious that the, the outcome variable here was power output on an ergometer, which we might expect to be pretty important for sprint cycling performance, but is not actual performance. The second thing is, because we recruited elite athletes from a range of disciplines, the endurance athletes were all clustered down here because we know that endurance athletes don't have particularly big muscles and aren't particularly powerful. So that wasn't particularly surprising. What would be more informative would be to look purely at sprint athletes, but across a range of performance standards, so through sub-elite and right up to elite. And there are two things that we took on board for this next study, uh, which, where we also changed sports. So this is now muscle anatomy and sprint running performance, uh, which was done in collaboration with British Athletics. Of course, elite sprinting is one of the most iconic uh, and impressive feats of human performance. Moreover, the ability to run fast is, is largely sought after in many sports not just track and field athletics, but, but many others, soccer, rugby, hockey, you could go on and on. In terms of muscle anatomy, while well, it's common observation that these athletes are relatively muscular, but the specific muscles important for fast running 
has not been very well defined. Um, previous research has tended to just look at a, a relatively limited small number of muscles and also often not included actual elite level athletes. If we look at the animal kingdom, these are some of the fastest land mammals. When you look at the distribution of their muscle mass, what you notice is it's, it's absolutely not uh, distal, but the muscle distribution is very much proximal here. So our hypothesis was that for very fast running in humans, the muscular development would be specific to the proximal part of the leg around, essentially, around the hip joint. So we did a couple of studies, one in males and one in females, two completely separate studies, but with very similar methods, and I'm going to talk through the results together. Um, in the male study, we compared elite sprinters with sub-elite sprinters with untrained controls. And here are the 100 meter personal best times for the sprint groups. So for the elite sprinters, their personal best time was just inside 10 seconds. Only five of them, which I appreciate is a relatively small group, but there really aren't that many people who can run this fast. So by definition, it has to be quite a small group if it's a very elite group. Um, our sub-elite sprinters also had really pretty good times, on average 10.6 and uh, nine seconds, and we had a pretty good group of those 26, and then we had some untrained unathletic controls in the male study. In the female study, we only had two groups, the elite sprinters and sub-elite sprinters. The reason for that is simply because we'd already done this study and we had a pretty good idea that there would be some interesting differences between the two sprint groups. And you can see their performance times were also really good. These are really good standard athletes. Um, we had all of the athletes do an MRI scan, this time from thoracic vertebra number 12 here, all of the way down the lower body. Again, axial images, cross-sectional images down the lower body, all the way to uh, the ankle in order to take comprehensive measurements of muscle volume of a wide range of muscles, actually 23 individual muscles or compartments. Um, that we were also able to combine together to form five functional muscle groups, the flexors and extensors of the hip and knee, as well as the plantar flexors. In terms of the, the data, well, we can express that both in absolute and relative to body mass terms, so centimeters cubed or centimeters cubed per kilo. And we can have an interesting can have an interesting discussion about which of these is actually most important. Um, but the findings were actually pretty similar. And if you're interested, I would encourage you to have a, have a look through the papers which go through both of them in very fine detail. But for simplicity, and because it's a little bit more intuitive, and because it doesn't affect the major findings, I'm going to stick with the absolute units uh, during this presentation. So. Here's what we found in terms of the muscle groups. This is for males, first of all. We have our five different functional muscle groups here down the side, and this is muscle volume in cubic centimeters. Uh, the most pronounced differences within the male study were actually for the hip extensors here. So the white bar is the untrained controls, and they're Hip extensor volume was a little over 2,000 cubic centimeters, whereas for the sub-elite sprinters, this gray bar, they were about a third bigger, and then the elite sprinters, the black bar, were a third bigger again. The percentage here is actually the difference between the elite and the sub-elite sprinters. For the hip flexors, knee flexors, and knee extensors, there was a very similar pattern with, again, significant differences between all three groups, but not quite such pronounced large differences as there was for the hip extensors. Whereas when we go to the plantar flexors, the more distal muscle group, there was actually no difference between the two sprint groups for the plantar flexors. Moving on to the female study, again, we have the five muscle groups down here. This is muscle volume. Just two groups now, sub-elite sprinters and elite sprinters. 
In this case, the biggest difference was here for the hip flexors, which was 28% larger in the elite versus sub-elite sprinters. There are also differences for the hip extensors and the knee extensors, uh, but again, no differences for the plantar flexors. So the findings did broadly support our hypothesis. There were bigger differences in these more proximal muscle groups, particularly hip extensors in males, hip flexors in females, and not in the more distal muscle groups. Moving on to the individual muscles. So this is an example MRI image slice actually through the hips and the pelvis, basically at this level, an axial image. And if you look carefully, what you can see here, this is the ball or the head of the femur on both sides, the ball within the socket of the hip joint. And you can see we've picked out some of the muscles here around the hip. Uh, and if I show also, this is a typical sub-elite sprinter, you can see that the muscles mostly look somewhat bigger. And if we go to an elite sprinter, they're substantially bigger. Again, it's very visual and pretty clear, the differences. I'll just talk a little bit about this muscle. This is the gluteus maximus, which is the large superior muscle in the backside. The average volume of the gluteus maximus in an untrained control participant was around 900 cubic centimeters. The average volume of the gluteus maximus in an elite sprinter was nearly twice as big, nearly 1800 cubic centimeters, which is a pretty dramatic difference. And just to have a little bit of fun with that, the difference between the untrained control and the elite sprinter is essentially equivalent to two 16 ounce rump steaks within the backside, one buttock of an athlete and two more on the other side. Of course, in France, I should be using the metric unit, so you could say two steaks of about 450 grams. Um, to, uh, to show some more specific values to do with the individual muscle differences. On this plot, I'm going to show the differences between elite and sub-elite 100 meter sprinters for the 23 muscles and compartments that we looked at. So this is first of all for the males, and this is the percentage difference between elite and sub-elite. So zero would mean the muscles are the same volume in those two groups, and anything this way is greater in elite, and anything that way is, would be greater in sub-elite. And we've ranked the muscles according to the size of the difference. Biggest difference is here, or differences in favor of sub-elite down here. And this is exactly the same for the females, ranked according to the size of the difference. Zero would be the same. This would be greater in elite. This is greater in sub-elite. There's an awful lot of information here, so I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. The first one is that the difference or the pattern in the muscularity is, is a very pronounced pattern. It's not that sprinters are uniformly got bigger muscles everywhere. It isn't like that. There's a really pronounced pattern here where some muscles are way bigger and other muscles are more or less the same or even a bit smaller, which is, is really interesting. It's anatomically specific uh, pattern that they have to their muscularity. In terms of the muscles that showed the biggest differences, well, if we look at these two completely separate studies in males and females, what you notice is the same three muscles which show the biggest differences in both studies. The tensor fascia latae, which is a small muscle at the hip, the sartorius and the gluteus maximus. I'll just make a few comments on two of these muscles. So firstly, the sartorius. The unique thing about the sartorius is that it it is a hip and knee flexor. It is the only muscle that is a hip and knee flexor. And that is a simultaneous action that occurs early in the swing phase of running. Essentially, when an athlete takes their foot off the ground, they then flex the hip and the knee at the start of the swing phase. And that's actually pretty important because until toe off, their leg is actually moving backwards relative to their body at high velocity, and it has a backward momentum compared to the center of mass. And therefore, to then 
change the direction of that limb very quickly in a very powerful way would seem to be useful to have a very well-developed sartorius. So biomechanically, this makes sense. Then the gluteus maximus. Well, the gluteus maximus is the largest hip extensor muscle um, that likely plays a critical role for high leg momentum in late swing. Essentially, in late swing, the leg is out in front of the athlete, but they need to bring it down very quickly to hit the ground hard in order to try and propel themselves forward. And then when the leg is on the ground, the gluteus maximus and the hip extensors are important for propelling the body over the leg. So again, biomechanically, this makes sense. Another interesting point about the gluteus maximus is, aside from sprinting, it's actually the single biggest muscle in the human body, which is really interesting. Now, why would humans have a big gluteus maximus? Why do they put a lot of energy into doing that? Well, in evolutionary terms, perhaps, because this muscle has a use, which is it enables humans in general to run fast. A little bit more on the gluteus maximus. So here are the correlations of the gluteus maximus size in terms of absolute volume and relative volume for males and for females with the 100 meter times. So we can see here all of these correlations were significant, uh, ranging from minus 0.48 up to minus 0.66. And here's an example scatter plot. So this is gluteus maximus volume in cubic centimeters for the male, amongst male sprinters. And the population here is the elite and sub-elite all plotted on the same graph and season's best 100 meter time. And you can see there's a pretty clear relationship here. And uh, if we go on and from, based on these correlations, actually calculate the coefficient of determination, what you find is that the volume of this one muscle, the gluteus maximus, appears to explain between 23 and 43% of the variability in before performance between athletes. To put that in context, 100 meter performance is generally considered to depend on a really wide range of factors, technique, psychology, nutrition, all manner of different anatomical, physiological and biomechanical factors. And yet one muscle seems to explain perhaps 30 or 40% of the variability, which seems quite remarkable. So to summarize from this, these studies on uh, sprint running, uh, across these two studies, elite sprinters were more muscular than sub-elite sprinters. They showed a distinct pattern to their muscularity with the biggest differences in the more proximal muscle groups, particularly the hip extensors and hip flexors. And these specific hip muscles, the gluteus maximus, tensor fascia latae and sartorius, and as we've seen, the sprint speed was also consistently correlated with gluteus maximus size, whether expressed in absolute or relative to body mass terms. I think there's also uh, an interesting wider implication to this. Um, and that is that if a sport task or event requires anatomically specific muscle characteristics for success, then training should be anatomically specific and targeted to develop these characteristics. Treating a whole person and training the whole body in the same way doesn't really make sense, or even a whole limb. It seems to be useful to develop the prerequisite characteristics for success in that event with very targeted, anatomically targeted training. So returning to my overview slide, we've done this first theme. Now going to move on to hamstrings anatomy, implications for sports injury. Here's a few reasons why it might be interesting to study the hamstrings muscle. Because hamstring strain injury is the most common injury in association football with five injuries per professional club per season. Hamstrings are a key constraint stabilizing the knee and preventing severe knee injuries, particularly ACL, anterior cruciate ligament rupture. And in this regard, you may be aware 
that there are large differences in the incidence of some lower limb injuries between males and females. For example, ACL injury incidence in females is two to 10 times higher that of males in agility sports. We were interested in whether there might be sex differences in knee, knee flexor, predominantly the hamstrings, strength and size that might contribute to these differences in injury incidence. Here's some data on maximum strength relative to body mass. This is isometric maximum strength relative to body mass in untrained females compared to males. So looking to see if there are inherent sex differences. So this is force, isometric maximum force, newtons per kilo in the knee extensors, the quadriceps, and you can see very similar scores in males and females. But when we look at the knee flexors, mainly the hamstrings, we see a different pattern where females are at a disadvantage, significantly lower by 15% knee flexion strength. So if we go on and calculate knee flexor to extensor strength ratio, often referred to as the hamstrings to quadriceps ratio, and widely thought to be an index of knee joint stability and injury risk, what we see is that females have a lower ratio of 50% compared to males at 56%. And this could influence stability of the knee joint because the hamstrings is a key constraint holding the tibia in place, preventing anterior tibial translation, one of the movements that often contributes to ACL rupture. We were interested following this in why what might account for that difference in knee flexion strength and therefore the strength ratio. And a, an intriguing possibility was that females simply have a disproportionately smaller hamstrings or knee flexor muscles. So we went on to do a, an MRI study um, to determine knee flexor to knee extensor muscle size ratio now. So not the strength ratio, but the size ratio of these muscles. And this is what we found. This is the knee flexor to knee extensor size ratio where the measure of size was maximum anatomical cross-sectional area measured with magnetic resonance imaging. And again, this was in untrained males versus females. And whilst there's a wide scatter of points here within each sex group, there was a significant difference where females appear to have a disproportionately smaller knee flexor relative to the knee extensors than in males. So the conclusion from this work was that females appear to have inherently smaller and weaker knee flexors, which may contribute and logically does contribute to their higher incidence of ACL injuries. I'm gonna delve more deeply now into the structure of the hamstrings muscle and particularly the structure of the bicep femoris long head. This muscle is interesting because the majority of hamstring strain injuries occur within this muscle, the bicep femoris long head, which is shown in context here. It's actually the muscle colored in red here. And then if I show on this picture, this is in isolation, we can see uh, the bicep femoris long head, and these are the bundles of muscle fibers within the muscle belly. And then this is the proximal tendon, and this extension of the tendon called the aponeurosis, which runs down the side of the muscle. In a pennate muscle such as this one, the muscle fibers actually uh, attach and therefore transmit force predominantly actually onto the aponeurosis rather than directly onto the tendon. I highlight these structures because the most common injury site within this most common injured muscle is this proximal region adjacent to the aponeurosis. So just here, just inside the aponeurosis. Furthermore, modeling studies indicate a concentration of mechanical strain adjacent to the proximal aponeurosis. So this is a diagrammatic representation of the muscle wall. This is the proximal tendon, and then the black line is the aponeurosis tending, 
extending down the side of the muscle, and then the muscle fiber strain has been color coded where the highest strain is shown in red and yellow. And we can see that that is concentrated in the same region, proximal next to, adjacent to the aponeurosis. So we were interested in, well, if this structure, the aponeurosis, is important in injury risk, could it be a, a potential risk factor for hamstring strain injury? And we started simply by characterizing this structure in terms of its size. So this is a study that looked at the size of the proximal aponeurosis of this bicep femoris long head muscle. And in particular, the contact width or distance or the contact area. Essentially the interface between the aponeurosis and the muscle. Uh, and we did this in 30 healthy untrained young men, again, using magnetic resonance imaging. And you can see this is the bicep femoris long head and the adjacent semitendinosus. And actually we have picked out the aponeurosis there. It's not showing that clearly. It's a little better on this zoomed in image. So the black region here is the aponeurosis and I've drawn on here the contact distance, what we kind of simplistically call the width, um, which is actually the interface between the muscle and the aponeurosis. Clearly this is just one slice or image and this aponeurosis runs down the side of the muscle. And if we measure this contact distance in a sequence of slices along the muscle, uh, then we can actually measure a contact area between the muscle and the aponeurosis, which is to some extent captured here. So this is the muscle aponeurosis contact distance measured in centimeters at different points all along the muscle. And here's data actually from three individuals. And what you notice is there's wide variability in the size of this aponeurosis between these individuals. We found really large variability in aponeurosis size such that the contact area between the muscle and the aponeurosis ranged by more than threefold, even in this relatively homogeneous group of healthy, untrained young men. So this led us to the following hypothesis, that a small bicep femoris long head proximal aponeurosis may concentrate mechanical stress in the muscle tissue adjacent to the aponeurosis and predispose to strain injury. Essentially, the mechanical stress from the muscle is, becomes very concentrated because it's attaching on to a relatively small aponeurosis. So we went on to do a retrospective injury study of male athletes. We first recruited 23 athletes with a prior hamstring strain injury of the proximal bicep femoris long head muscle. The injury definition was two or more clinically verified strain injuries to the proximal region of the bicep femoris long head. But importantly, all of these athletes had returned to normal training and competition at least three months prior to the measurements. So these were historical injuries. They were not current injuries. Now, some of these athletes in this group of 23 had injuries to both legs. So they were had a history of bilateral injury. But 12 of them had a unilateral injury history. So they had a history of injury on one leg, but the other leg was completely healthy and it always had been healthy. And I'm just going to show some analysis from these individuals comparing their previously injured leg to their healthy leg. And these are two measures of aponeurosis size. So firstly, maximum width, and then aponeurosis area, and comparing the leg that had the prior hamstring strain injury to the leg that had no prior hamstring strain injury or was healthy. And what you can see is that in both cases, the previously injured leg had a smaller aponeurosis by both measures. 
The other analysis that we did was we gathered together all of the legs that had clinically verified injuries within this group, and there were 28 of those legs, and we compared them to healthy legs from a control group of 23 athletes who had no prior hamstring strain injury history. So they had always had healthy legs, but were matched for sport, age, sex, and height. And we had obviously 46 healthy legs in this group, and we compared these injured legs to healthy legs for exactly the same measures of aponeurosis size, maximum width, aponeurosis area. And again, we saw that the prior hamstring strain injured leg had a smaller aponeurosis compared to healthy legs in both cases. So the conclusion from this study was that a small aponeurosis seems to be associated with hamstring strain injury history. However, from a retrospective study, we can't be sure about cause or consequence. It could be that a small aponeurosis leads to injury, but it could equally be that injury leads to a small aponeurosis. We can't be sure of that from a retrospective study. So certainly more work and prospective studies are required, but this looks like a candidate to be a risk factor for hamstrings strain injury. Returning to my overview slide, so we've covered the first two themes. And given that muscle size seems to be important for athletic performance, um, and the size of tenderness tissues seems to be important for athlete resilience and avoidance of injury, trying to increase the size of these muscle and tenderness tissues has had a lot of attention. Um, and one obvious way to potentially do that is with resistance training, which I'm going to come on to now. And in the first study, also has a nutritional component because nutrition could amplify potentially the effects of training on the adaptations of these tissues. So this is a study that looked at muscle and tenderness tissue adaptations to resistance training as well as collagen peptide supplementation. Collagen peptides appear to have some bioactive properties and have been suggested to enhance the growth of various tissues, including muscle and tendon in response to exercise and training. So we recruited 39 young men who completed 15 weeks of resistance training three times per week, so 45 training sessions of knee extension, leg press, and knee flexion with a fairly standard, pretty heavy loading regime. And each participant uh, was supplemented with 15 grams per day of either collagen peptides or a placebo in a randomized double-blind design. I'm going to present the muscular findings first of all. Uh, so this is for isometric strength, so knee, the change in knee extension maximum voluntary torque measured isometrically from pre to post in both the collagen peptide group and the placebo group. And you can see that the improvements were pretty much identical, around 22% improvement in both groups. This next finding was more surprising to me, certainly. Um, it's quadriceps muscle volume, again measured with very careful magnetic resonance imaging. So relatively thin slices all of the way down the muscle, at least 20 slices contributing to the volume measurement. And this is the change in quadriceps volume from pre to post training expressed as a percentage. And what you can see is that the collagen group improved by more than the placebo group, uh, around 15% versus 10%, which is actually quite a substantial amplification of the training response. And when we looked at total muscle volume, so this was the summed volume of the quadriceps, the hamstrings, and the gluteus maximus, measured pre and post training, we saw the same thing. 
the collagen peptide group around 16 and the placebo group around 11% and a significant advantage of the collagen peptide group. Moving on to the tenderness tissue adaptations. This is tendon size. The cross-sectional area, the mean cross-sectional area of the patella tendon pre and post training for the, for the placebo and collagen peptide group. So, and you can see there were no significant changes. Tendon size did not appear to adapt or at least the changes were less than 2% and not significant. However, the material properties of the tendon in terms of its tendon stiffness, which is its elongation under load, did adapt to the training as has been well documented in the literature. So this is patella tendon stiffness, pre and post training, and it increased significantly in both groups by 21 and 17% but there was no difference between the two supplementation groups. And then lastly, this is the aponeurosis size. Now, this isn't the same aponeurosis I was talking about earlier on within the hamstrings, but it is an aponeurosis nonetheless, this time within the vastus lateralis. And we can see that aponeurosis size does seem to adapt with training, but wasn't sensitive to this type of supplementation. So improvements of around 10% in both groups. And it's interesting that the aponeurosis seems to adapt even though the free tendon doesn't seem to adapt. Considering the free tendon response in a little bit more detail, one possibility is that the free tendon just needs more time, more training time in which to adapt. So we've also done uh, some study looking at how does long-term resistance training affect muscle and tenderness tissue. Uh, in this study, there was a comparison of two groups of young men, long-term resistance trained individuals, 16 of those with an average four years of heavy resistance training. So week in, week out, heavy training for many years compared to untrained controls, 39 of those with no history of resistance training. First of all, the muscular changes or differences. This is maximum voluntary torque, isometric strength. As you would expect, the long-term trained group were nearly 60% stronger than untrained controls. Similarly, for quadriceps volume, muscle size, the long-term trained group, 56% bigger muscles than the untrained controls. Nothing that surprising here. We were particularly interested in the tenderness tissue differences though. And this is aponeurosis size, vastus lateralis aponeurosis size, which was 17% bigger in the long-term trained group. So a modest difference compared to these muscular differences, but a difference, a clear difference nonetheless, suggesting that perhaps Again, the aponeurosis is adaptable to training. And this is the free tendon, patella tendon mean cross-sectional area, which was identical between these two groups. And that's despite the fact that this group has been training regularly for many years. And because they're strong and they're training regularly with heavy weights, they're exposing the tendon to these very high forces on a regular basis, yet there's still no apparent adaptation of the tendon in terms of its size, which is maybe quite surprising. So the conclusions from this work was that aponeurosis size, but not tendon size, increases with medium and long-term resistance training. Collagen peptide supplementation may enhance muscle hypertrophy with, with resistance training, but doesn't seem to affect the tenderness tissues, and also, somewhat curiously, that hypertrophic effect didn't flow through to strength gains, which is maybe surprising, but might perhaps be because strength gains depends on a lot more than just hypertrophy, and perhaps the neural factors also interfere or dilute that hypertrophic difference. 
just going to finish off with a little bit of fun science. Um, if you're interested in long-term resistance training uh, and muscle and tenderness tissue adaptation, it might be interesting to take some measurements from this guy. I mentioned him earlier on. His name is, is Eddie Hall. And in 2017, he was the world's strongest man, meaning he won the world's strongest man competition. He's also a double world champion at the deadlift. Uh, for a number of years, he held the world record for a deadlift by deadlifting 500 kilos. And uh, as you can see, we got him to come to the neuromuscular lab um, uh, about a year after he won the world's strongest man title. Um, and we did a range of functional tests with him. But the most interesting thing we did um, was we got him in the MRI scanner and we took a, uh, spent a lot of time with him taking some detailed measurements there. And I'm just gonna sh put those measurements next to the data I've just shown uh, in terms of untrained controls and long-term resistance trained individuals. So this is his uh, quadriceps muscle volume. You can see this is the untrained controls, about 2000 cubic centimeters the long-term trained, about 60% higher. And then this is the world's strongest man where his quadriceps was two and one third of the size of untrained controls. And this is the patella tendon data for our untrained controls, long-term trained, as I've said, not really a difference between these groups, but the world's strongest man, well, he did have a somewhat larger tendon, 30% bigger than untrained, but of course, he is a very big man. So you might expect him to have big tendons inherently. And when you look carefully, actually, his tendon size was, is not really out with the range of values that we've seen in these other populations. And then one final measurement with him, which I haven't mentioned in the presentation, but the patella tendon moment arm, which is simply the leverage of the quadriceps around the knee joint, the mechanical leverage. And untrained controls, long-term trained individuals, pretty similar, but the world's strongest man, he had 21% greater moment arm or greater leverage, which you might expect would be useful for strength and power performance. So in summary, the world's strongest man had a number of anatomical advantages for high muscle strength and robust tissues, large muscles, large tendons, and high joint leverage. Just for me, some, remains for me to thank the funders of the work of the Neuromuscular Lab and these key collaborators who played a huge role in uh, the studies I've talked about. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jonathan. Is there any question? Is there any question? Thanks, Jonathan, for your great presentation. Just a question about the first part of your uh, presentation about the muscle morphology. How do you explain the TFL uh, hypertrophy and the impact that uh, uh, it's going to have on, uh, on um, running phases as uh, gluteus maximus and uh, the, other max uh, the other muscle uh, on the hip muscles? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I kind of skipped over that because in a way we don't, I don't have a very specific explanation for why the TFL is, 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 is very large in elite sprinters. Apart from, um, anatomically, there are only two muscles that attach onto the iliotibial band. One of them is the gluteus maximus, which is obviously very large in those sprinters. And the other is the tensor fascia latte. Um, so it's just possible that in some way, because of the very high development of the gluteus maximus, the tensor fascia latte becomes developed. Perhaps it needs to in order to stabilize the iliotibial band. Um, that's my best explanation. Um, because it's not a very big muscle, it's not particularly powerful, or you would think important. Um, but something around the iliotibial band, perhaps. Good question, thank you. Any other question? I've got one question, uh, Jonathan. I was wondering about the hypothesis of the proximal aponeurosis. 
did you get to measure that uh, that measure in the very strong man that you show here? <laughs> um, we 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 could. We haven't actually measured it. Okay, your reasoning like that. I was just thinking yeah. about your first study when you compare like a very elite uh, sprinters yes. with sub elite, yes, and uh, in which you show that there is a uh, significant differences overall in muscle volume. Yes, I was just wondering whether when when we think about this uh, aponeurosis size, yes, yes, do we think like in absolute terms or is it relative to the muscle volume of the well, leg? That, that's a really interesting question. So we think the aponeurosis can adapt. It does adapt, but it seems to adapt more slowly than the muscle, which if you think about the transmission of force, if the problem is a concentration of mechanical stress, um, then sure, making the aponeurosis bigger would, should help. But if the muscle gets bigger and stronger and produces more force and it gets disproportionately bigger compared to the aponeurosis, that would almost seem to create more of a problem, if that makes sense. So, but the rationale may not be correct. So we don't really understand how these things interconnect. Um, but we do, we do now have some data from a training study that, that indicates that that specific aponeurosis within the bicep femoris long head does adapt with training. Um, but yes, but by less than the muscle which is slightly counterintuitive from a training seems to reduce injury risk point of view. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. It was very, very interesting. A uh, number of questions, but maybe a very basic one uh, regarding the role of uh, the gluteus on performance, because you show this relationship between the size and uh, potentially the performance in ecological conditions. And we have discussions with some federation which may relate it to, do you think that there is a sailing? Or do you uh. think that this relationship will continue? Because we have some examples uh, where we see some athletes with morph morphological aspects like bobsled sprinters. They develop very strong glutes, mm -hmm. but we are not so sure that they are sprinting faster than rugby players or whatever, but mm -hmm. we, we, we are interested in how to use the way they are training to develop this muscle mass. Yeah. But do you think that it's still interesting above a certain level of uh, muscle mass and strength? Yes. An open question, maybe. Yeah, it, it, it's hard to know. Is there a ceiling? Um, we, we, we simply don't really know. Um, uh, I, I kind of suspect Probably not, actually. I think when we, I mean, what, what, what we did there was look at amongst sprinters, which means they have certain fairly common characteristics. Um, for example, in likely in the, the anatomy of their foot, their ankle, they probably have some very similar characteristics, which means their transmission of force to the ground is much better than the general population or many people. Um, so that might be an issue. So if you put a huge gluteus maximus in somebody who ha doesn't have that ability to trans transmit force to the ground, maybe it's not so useful and you lose more of that force. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I mentioned briefly, you know, the, 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 the use of absolute values and relative to body mass values for the muscle volumes, which is a really interesting debate. Um, you know, based on what we've found, I would argue that, that, you know, everyone has always assumed that it should be relative values because you have to use your, move your body mass when you run a sprint, which, which makes sense on one level. But based on what we found in the fact that there are, uh, clearly differences and relationships for absolute muscle volumes. That seems to me to be telling us something. The absolute muscle volumes cannot be irrelevant, else there just would not be those differences in relationships. Um, so why is that? Um, you know, th 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 there's a number of possibilities. Um, certainly amongst the males, my uh, feeling is, <laughs> or my anecdotal impression is, and there is very little data on this, although it's very simple, is that elite sprinters, the average is quite big people, actually, quite tall. Now, it's not, I don't think it's selective, 
So you can still get sprinters who are average size, but the average, I think, is bigger. Um, uh, so I think there is an, and that, and that suggests absolute size has an ab, some kind of value. Um, it's, that's a little less clear in females, but uh, sorry if I've kind of spun off in different directions there, but. If I may, maybe a last question in, in relationship with the, this one, I was just wondering in one of the graphs that you show, uh, there was the relationship between gluteus max and the, the performance, sprint yes. performance. Yes. And uh, I've got the impression that on the left, so those who run faster, uh, it was more dispersed, the data. Uh, I think we have some points in which uh, there yes. may be like a huge yes. difference yes. in, in volume. Yes. yes. How do you interpret that? What, what's the reasoning? Yeah, uh, hard to know. Hard to know I, if that's genuine or really a, th a thing, a phenomenon or not. Um, uh, I mean, so, certainly, you know, the, the, the male sprinters that we, we assessed, they were quite big guys, no doubt about it. And they're not all. Um, and with an N of only five, it's, it's really hard to know if, if there's something systematic there. Uh, but certainly they, they did have very pronounced gluteus maximus and hip extensors in general. Um, yeah. Thanks. Any other question? So maybe we can leave it here. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank you for your Thanks. attendance.